I am a Holocaust survivor. I am here to share with you what I learned in that horrible place, how I lived, if you can call that life, and what are they wanted to do with us. I have three reasons to talk. Number one, that you should have someone who been there and I was told that you can read a book, you see a movie, but when you see someone who been there, then it gets to really true. The second reason I am talking about it, because I lately I am hearing statements saying, well, the Holocaust didn't happen at all. When I hear that, I am getting really angry. They are telling me that it didn't happen. I lost my whole family. I suffered. I almost died and telling me it didn't happen, uh-uh. I am a witness until I am alive. The third reason I am talking about that, because I know I cannot bring back my family. They are gone. But when talking about that, what happened to them, I am honoring them and sending my love for them. And I can thank you, all of you who is here, to giving me the chance to talk about them. Thank you. In 1933, I was 11 years old when Hitler came to power in Germany. We lived in Hungary. And Budapest is the capital that's where we lived. We heard that in Germany were changing. It became a dictatorship. We heard that horrible things are happening there, but we still were hoping that maybe it will stop. In 1939, the Second World War broke out. We heard that the SS soldiers, the German soldiers, occupied the small European countries almost weekly. Years went by, and in 1944, March 19, the SS troops marched into Hungary. Lots of, lots of, lots of soldiers, and we didn't know what will happen. All of a sudden, we learned what will happen. We live in a big city, and then they created a ghetto. I'm sure you know what ghetto is. It's a small location where they concentrated all the people the, with the Jewish religion. Our house was the borderline of the ghetto. When we looked out the window, we did see the road, and the other side of the road, it was free. We became prisoners in our own 
house through which they took. Eight more families were put in our normal family home. They got crowded. They were sleeping in the hallway. If they wanted to have a glass of water, they had to stand in line. If they wanted to go to the bathroom, stand in line. And at night, when we should have been sleeping, was not sleeping, people were crying, screaming, talking. We were afraid. What will happen to us? Three weeks later, we had to wear the yellow star. This is the shape, but this is what I got after the war, and I am very proud to wear it. It was out of some material. We had to go to the store, buy with our own money, more than one, because we had to put it right here above our heart. I remember the first time I stepped outside with that yellow star, I felt embarrassed. Why? Because people looked at me differently. I was the same person, a young girl. What is it? Then I learned the yellow star. And then, two weeks later, came an order, all men who are from 18 to 55 have to pack a package and then report in the forced labor camp. After I finish speaking and you ask questions, I will explain what was that camp. My father was 48. He had to go. I remember he was packing his backpack, my mom helping him, and my mom was crying the whole time. Next day, when my father left with tears in his eyes, my mom kept on crying, and I was the oldest one. I begged her, please don't cry. Maybe he comes back. She said, Noemi, I have a horrible feeling that I will never, ever see him again. I am so sorry to tell you she was right. They were married for 25 years, a beautiful, loving family, hard work, a lot of music, reading. They never met again. Who left back in that ghetto? Grandpas, grandmas, young mothers with babies, and young girls Then I was then. We couldn't get outside. For three months we were in our own home, but no food came in. We were eating whatever we had in the home, and we were waiting. What do they want with us? And then came the order. All of you in that get to pack a package and tomorrow line up in your own backyard. What we had to pack. They even told us one small pillow, one bed sheet about this long, only dry food, and 
no variables. We heard over and over again, not even a ring. Don't you have it somewhere? Hide them. We found it. And if we do, watch out. And then they said, oh, you can take one change of underwear. Where are we going? Nobody told them. I remember next day when we left our home. You cannot forget that, and we never got back there. First, they watched us if we were following order, and then they had to go through the whole city with the big yellow star with the package. Outside was a factory. Nobody worked there, it was empty. We were told we have to go up to the second floor. They showed us letters. I was, of course, much younger. I was the first one who started to climb on the ladder with my package. But I was about the halfway of this ladder when occurred to me, where is my mom? Because I had my grandma, my mom, who was 43 and a half, my little sister, who was 12 years old, and a little bitty brother, six months old. And I was 21 and a half. And as I was climbing, I didn't see them coming. I got really scared. Where are they? And as I was climbing, I was halfway up when I heard somebody is coming to warn me. And then I felt a horrible pain. A soldier came. He took out his bayonet. I don't know if you know what bayonet is. It's a very sharp, long side tool of killing. Very, very sharp edge. He pushed my back. I can, I feel it even now. And yet, you may not stop, you may not look, you may not do anything else. Once more, he pushed me, almost fell over, but you have to climb. Finally, he let me go, and I was thinking, what did I do? I just wanted to know where is my family. I got up on the second floor. Later, everybody got up. My family also. We settled down in a corner, put the little package down. But everything what we would need was downstairs. Some water, a little bit of food, and bathroom. We had to use a horrible ladder for 10 days. We felt dirty, hungry, lost, and we had no idea what they want with us. After 10 days came the order. You put your package together and get down to the backyard of this factory in a half an hour. They didn't have to tell us again. We got ready. Why? Because we had hope. We should have, always have hope. But we were hoping that if we get away from here, maybe 
the other plagues will be battled. We got on the Hungarian soldier greeted us, and then they gave us over the waiting German soldiers. When this happened, we ceased to be human beings in their eyes. We became a number. Behind them was a long, long train. The train was made out of cattle cars. We had to march there. I spoke perfect German also and Hungarian. I heard them counting. Eighty-five of us was pushed up in that very small cattle cart. It was end of June. It was hot. They locked us in the outside. Inside, no ventilation, and 85 people. Of course, no food and no bathroom. I learned, as I was still standing, they had to put the package in the center. When I did mine in my families, I was still standing and I looked around. What is that? What did I see? In each end, an SS guard with the gun. Then I did see two buckets on each end. I was a prisoner. I was not supposed to speak at all. I turned around and asked one of the guards, what are those buckets for? He answered, one of each will have water in it, and the other is for sanitary purposes for 85 people. Here in high school, I cannot and should not explain what the sanitary purposes meant. These buckets had no cover. People had to use it. And any time I am speaking about it, excuse me, I still feel and smell the horrible stench in that cattle car. The train started to move. Little babies were crying, school aged children asking, where is my, our books, my bed? What, what is that? We couldn't answer. We didn't know either. As we were going, my grandma, we were about halfway, stood up and started to talk to us. Of course, in Hungarian, she said, I have it. It is mine. And nobody, but nobody can take it away from me. She repeated three times, but she had nothing in her hand. I got so scared. She was so short, so wonderful. What is she talking about? Finally, she bent on. She had a skirt in a big pocket and pulled out about this size of silver candle holder. I told you, she said, I have it. Everybody became so quiet. What did the as I said, not even a ring. And she is standing there with a very, 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 very famous for her silver candle holder. We were afraid if the God come in, 
they will kill us all. I had to pry her finger away. Finally, I got the candle holder and put it in my package. She was already sitting down and crying. And I always say I love that grandma, always, very much. After this, I loved her even more. That dear old lady taught me in the cattle car two things, courage and tradition. We traveled eight days. Finally, we stopped. I looked it out the window. It was a train station. I don't speak Polish. It was Auschwitz. But the other word was Auschwitz. We didn't know what Auschwitz meant. We were happy that they opened the door some fresh air came in, and we were told that we have to leave even the small package there, get out, line up in two. I was standing with my mom, she had the baby, behind me my grandma and my little sister. It was a long, long line. We were tired. First, I didn't see anything special. Then all of a sudden, I noticed that the top of the line is separated. We didn't know why until we got to the top. What did I see? There was an SS German officer in his uniform. He had white gloves on his hand and in one hand a horse whip. He looked at us, all five of us. When he finished looking, he raised his arm with the horse whip and he said, my grandma, my mom, my little sister, and my little brother to his left. Then he looked at me and he sent me to the right. We couldn't speak to each other anymore. I remember I turned around and I did see my mom turning to warn me and she had my little brother in her arm. But I did see her beautiful eyes, and her beautiful eyes was almost talking to me. She said, Noemi, take care of yourself. Noemi, I love you. And this was the very last time I saw them. I didn't see them again, but in my heart and in my brain, that's how I've seen them always when talking about them. And then they sent me away from them. They pushed us in a barrack. Here we had to undress everything. We were able to keep only our pair of shoes into another barrack. Here they shaved our head. They didn't cut our hair. They shaved it. My head looked like my palm. And then they pushed us in an other room. Here we were told that we will be having shower. We did see shower heads, but nothing to open the shower. 
we had lock because in the other room they opened up the shower this time water came and then here we standing shaved not only our head all body parts no towel no dress just pair of shoes then we did see on our left as as women guards and they had a big bunch of dresses and we were told that this dresses belong to women who were killed already and they told us to march and as we were marching they were throwing the sex we have to catch it and no matter what size or what was we had to bear it and then they led us off to the camp ground here we did many 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 people we did see barracks we stopped in one barrack and we had a lot of german shepherd dogs everywhere as we were marching and somebody stepped up just a little bit those dogs were trained and jumped on us and almost killed us just because we stepped up a little bit then finally we stopped in a as in the front of a barrack every barrack had six rooms in every single room hundred of us was pushed in dirt floor no no latrine nothing in it no food dirt thing and those rooms were very near early morning they wake woke up to up we had to line up outside and we were told that from early morning late at night outside rain or shine we could go back only to so called sleep as we were so lining up outside we were told we get breakfast it was start we were young and hungry what was for breakfast in one cup they had so called coffee and one slice of bread was not allowed I am almost embarrassed to tell you what what was for dinner the same one cup of coffee one slice of bread we couldn't wait that the other slice of bread was coming and while we were eating that we learned that this bread was made out of flour and for on other thing they put on was not even close to flour tasted horrible but we were eating it because that was the only thing we got here came lunch what was for lunch we were told we will have soup we were waiting for the bowl never came the on the very top of the line the first one got a huge bowl they put in so called soup she had to drink our to it and give it over and over and over and over 
to everyone. When he got to the group I was in, although we were hungry, we said, please, please, Pastor, we don't want it. Why? We were not hungry, yes, we were, but we were so close here to home, we couldn't bring ourselves to drink after so many people. The God came and he spoke not only German, Hungarian. He said, I heard you people say no. You have to do that you can not say no in this place. You do what we tell you to do or else. We were there long enough to learn that if the other God says or else means if you don't do it, we kill you. We were young, we wanted to be alive somehow, and then we decided we will be drinking it. We learn again an other thing, but I have to share with you a very personal thing. I was 21 and a half. I was in a place where thousands of thousands of young women were. What young women have every month, menstruation period, and the Nazis didn't want to deal with that either. I will be very personal. When I got down from the cattle car and I had to leave everything behind, I got mine. I had to march. I got separated from my family. I got shaved and drinking water and shower, and I had my menstruation. I always say I never, ever in my life, I felt so lonely, so lost. What should I do? I have one leg on it. Whom should I turn? to the gods, and then the first time they said no, and the next time when they said, if you don't, we kill you, we started to drink that soup. One hour after we finished drinking that soup, those of us who had the period stopped. And then we learned that this thing in the soup was a newly fine medication which stopped the menstruation, the period, for thousands of thousands of young women. Why? Because in case if we survive, or we get liberated, we should not have babies. I know about three of my friends got liberated, got married, wanted to have family, couldn't have any. They were destroyed there inside. And whenever I share this, I have to hold myself and not to yell. It's horrible to de dare to do that. But then I think I better smile. Smile? Why? I was drinking out of the soup, but I must have had a strong body 
good genes because when I got liberated, you will hear how, I got married, I had two sons, five grandchildren, and eight great-grandbabies. I am a winner. I am a winner. And I feel a winner because I got liberated. I have my dear family. I am escaped from Hungary and I came to big heart to America. I am an American citizen and I live here with my dear, dear family, but I know and I feel that I have to be thankful. I wish that everybody who lives here is making it sure that you uh, know what freedom is. I will tell some more. In Auschwitz, again, people were standing, we got the so-called breakfast, and then they were checking us if everybody is sick. And some people, we were, we were hungry, no food, faded away. The guards picked them up put them on a truck. They were taken away. We never saw them. One day, I never gave up, but I was very sick, and I started to fall. But how come that I didn't get on that truck? What happened? In the place where horror, terror, Killing every minute was done. How come that I made it? You know what? I got something precious. I got friends. I'm sure you have friends. I have friends. Over there, as we were standing, one on my right, one of my left and one in the middle, when they saw me falling, in minutes they decided to risk in their own life to save mine. The right, the left, the middle one was holding me at my one rag on me and were able to hold me straight, the guards didn't notice. Finally, the country was over. They made me sit down. I woke up, said, what happened? I learned in this horrible place, I had wonderful human beings who saved me. Then I got liberated later on, and I went back to Budapest. One other of the three lived in Budapest, in the capital of Hungary. She gave me a big hug. Noemi, do you remember what happened to you in our street? said, sure I do, maybe I would not be here. And I became a good, good friend. I was there in Budapest two years ago, and then I learned that she passed away. We have to go back to Auschwitz again. We did not have food really, and no water. Occasionally they brought in water, put it in the 
some kind of thing they give up a glass and they said go drink water we didn't have water for weeks and weeks we were so thirsty we got to this place try to dip in the water the the not the glass water but the kind of thing what they gave us and we tried to have some water but then those of us who spoke um, uh, german we heard what the gods were telling to each other what he they were saying look at them these are not human beings these are not even animals these are little worms they kill each other for water we were not killing each other we were trying to have some water when we heard that the next time they brought in water many of us i was with them we did not even try i was to almost three months in auschwitz i didn't have water during that three months and then ever i speak about it i am getting really thirsty look what it is here can you see that yes that is water and i am thirsty excuse me <laughs> oh it's delicious just a little bit <laughs> you know what i love water any time and that is what i want to tell you because i know that you don't see anything written on that one it is just water and glass do you know what is written here for me it says right here freedom for me to have water no matter how long time ago when i wake up in the night i am speaking about the holocaust i go anywhere i can have water that is freedom for me you know what when you go home today would you please drink a glass of water think about it for almost four months i did not have any water and that is the best thing among many things that i am joy to be free in our ship i have to tell one more thing we didn't know where were our dear ones we got separated but we didn't know where are they we tried to ask nobody answered finally a woman got came and we asked her tell us where are they she said you really want to know yes ma'am she said i will tell you but you have to watch she pointed on the sky she said do you see that cloud over there yes we do do you smell that horrible smell in that camp yes we do 
horses had a lot of, lot of chimneys. One of them was nearby. She pointed one of the chimney and said, do you see all those fire is going on day and night? Do you see it? Yes, ma'am. But where are they? And then she said, watch. She pointed on the air and said, here are your relatives. You see, here they go all the way to the fire. We thought that she is crazy or weird. What is she talking about? And then we learned she told us the truth. Then we got separated. They went to a barrack like us. They had to undress and they kept their shoes. Then they went to the other barrack as we do and then they shaved our head. But when they went to the third camp barrack where we had the show, they told them they will have a shower. It was not a shower. It was a gas chamber. And then all those dear ones were waiting for the water. They threw in Cyclone B gas. It opened up. And all those dear ones my grandma, my mom, my little sister, my little brother, uncle, aunt, and all who were waiting for the shower got suffocated in the gas chamber. And when they didn't move anymore, they put them in a carrier, they threw them in the crematorium, and burn them. I went back six times to Auschwitz as a free woman. And every time I go, the first thing I go is gas chamber number five, which already the Nazis already killed the, the shower. But there are the bricks, the wires. That's where I go first. Because I just cannot imagine and feel to be able to do that. To kill all those innocent people. I almost forget what happened to me. And I am just looking and touching those bricks. I first, when I was getting away from Auschwitz, I went back to Hungary. But when I came back as a free woman from here, and I get from Auschwitz, to be called America. I felt that I made my dear ones free because I remembered them in a free country. I know we always have problems, problem, a lot of problems, but this is a free country. And I would like you to learn and appreciate and work for it always to keep it free. And I feel that I made my dear ones free because I am talking about them to you, the next generation who will be able to say 
I listened to someone who was a prisoner in Auschwitz, but she imagined and appreciated freedom. I was in Auschwitz for three more weeks than the man who separated me from my dear ones. His name was Dr. Joseph Mengele. As he was standing up for breakfast, he said, I will select you. You and you and you and you. Thousands of us that Auschwitz was a huge place. Thousands, thousands of us were selected. We were told that he got a request from Germany that they need thousand Hungarian girls to go there and help them in their war effort. They gave us the prisoner outfit. We got in a cattle car through over Europe from Poland to Germany. Here was a camp, Buchenwald. For 10 days we did work. And we had a little bit of good, better time than in our ship because the Nazis realized that nobody can work if painting away. So they gave us a little bit more food, not a lot. It was winter. We didn't have jacket. We had no socks and wooden shoes. And we had to march about two, almost three miles to the factory. In a factory, we met an engineer, a foreman, a lot of, lot of guards with the gun. They let us in in a huge room, long tables, and on the tables, big, big balls, very colorful, and wires. We were told that we have to work on these. These are, will be all of them. Bombs. They selected us to work with that chemical poison. We were told, if we drop one of the balls, it will be open up, everybody will die. We were selected, 25 of us. We looked at each other, why don't we drop it? Or the Nazis will die. We decided not good because we will die too. Uh -uh. We want to live. And then we decided we used what they didn't have the gun and the, and, and the soldiers in the other room. And we are in that big, big place with all this. We have to put the same color of ball to the same color of bile. When this was done, it was in the other part of the factory. And then they put these bombs on the airplane and used for what? To bomb those we are praying to liberate us, the Allies, the Americans. We felt so bad. We are making the bombs. What should we do? And then we spoke Hungarian, 
They didn't understood one word. One of us said, you know what? Let's make a little sabotage. Uh, what an idea. How do you do it? It was easy. We were young and we wanted to do something. We messed up the whole, whole thing. Do you see these hands? No gloves. These were the hands were touching those chemical bombs. We have to put the green with the green, the red with the red. But what we did was we made a big mess. We took the green big ball and put a red wire in it. Yellow big ball, black wire in it. We made such a mess of it, and we loved it. We were laughing and giggling, and in the other room, full with SS guards with the gun. And they didn't come in very many times. Whenever they came in, we put green with the green, yellow with the yellow, as they were out. We made the mess. We couldn't imagine why they didn't come to check on us. We learned, excuse me, those dumb Nazis, they were hearing us laughing. They thought that we are having a good time working for them and they didn't want to disturb us. They didn't disturb us. We made such a mess for seven months, but we didn't know if we did a good job until in Bellingham, I spoke in the Central Library, and a middle-aged man was in the first row. And when I was saying that, I also said, I still don't know if we did a good job. He said, but I do. I said, sir, excuse me, what do you know? He said, I was for six months in Germany. I was there when we were going to Berlin. Hitler was still alive. And the Nazis was bombing us, day and night. But to our surprise, all of a sudden, what did notice, bomb came in, no, no explosion. Then again, and then again, we had no idea. How come the bomb is coming in? No explosion. I, he said, no, I know what happened. And I said, finally I know that it worked. And I hope that many of them was mine because I messed up a lot of one. And that's how I learned that we did a good job. And that was, I felt kind of winning. They called us veterans because we maybe were able to save American life. What happened to their uniform? They left it in the forest. That gave us an idea. They must know that the liberators are coming closer. They didn't want to be in the SS uniform. When they got on the highway, we were marching. They wanted to take us away, far away, from the camp 
and from the liberators, twelve of us, as we were walking, we noticed a very thick forest. And I don't know how we got the courage. Slowly, carefully, twelve of us disappeared from the highway. We were in the forest. We heard people, somebody's coming. Uh-uh. They found us. It was a soldier, but not a German soldier. It was an American soldier. She, she said, we are coming closer. I know who you are. He spoke English and German. We spoke Hungarian and German. It was interesting that we understood each other in German. And he said, we are coming closer. We are having, you will hear gunshots. You will see fire. I will coming back. Take care. He left. We heard the gunshots. All, everything. Twelve little skeleton girls. We lost weight. No hair, prison outfit. And then he came back. He was standing in front of them. And what did he say? You are all free. This part of Germany surrendered. The war was not over yet, but that part was free. What was the situation? Twelve skeleton young girls, ugly, no hair. And who is standing in front of us? A very good looking young American soldier. What did he say? You are.